Welcome to another episode of Elevate Your Grind brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. I am your host, Todd Rosales. We, listen, I, I say this all the time. We have amazing episodes lately, and it's just a testament to the show, to be honest with you. We have people who are on CNBC, on Cheddar, uh, Benzinga, all these great platforms, and they're deciding to spend their time as well, too. And it's an honor to have them. And honestly, these are some great conversations, and I can't wait to get into today's show. Um, our guest today is actually related to an alumni of the show, somebody that I'm very excited to have on. And I don't feel like I really need to drag this out as far as an introduction, but I've got to promote what's coming up. So tomorrow, join us live at five o'clock. We've got Case Mandel from Canadips. It's an awesome product. I've tried it. I use it on the golf course. Highly recommend it. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more tomorrow. And then we have Kristen Yoder at 6.30 on Thursday. Those are going to be our live episodes. Today, we dropped our recorded episodes of Cynthia Solarizeta, Brady Cobb, and then Erica Daniels. Um, Erica Daniels is the founder of Hope Grows for Autism. That is one we didn't do live. It is just going straight to the recording. Uh, you know, I get to talk to a lot of great business people. I get to talk to a lot of great entrepreneurs, people doing fun things in this industry and everything else. But every so often, I get to speak to somebody like Erica, who is actually doing this for all the right reasons. She's focusing on leveraging cannabis to treat autistic children. And there's a whole science behind that. It's really cool. It was an awesome conversation. Um, it's definitely one that you guys should check out. Not that you shouldn't check out Brady or Cynthia, but you know, if I had to pick one of the three, because you only got an hour, go with Erica for now, and then put the other two on your uh, queue to watch later. But today... I have someone who is truly a titan of the industry. Um, his sister may get some of the credit. She might be in a few more places than he is. But if you look at the statistics, the gentleman who is on my show today is the 2019 Hedge Fund Manager of the Year, the number, part, managing partner of the number one fund in 2016 and 2018. He took a little time off in 2017 or something like that. He was only number 10 out of everybody, but you know, we'll, we're going to go and dig into that a little bit further. Please welcome Morgan Paxia, managing partner of Poseidon Asset Management. Morgan, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for having me. That's a hell of an intro. I love that. <laughs> Those stats come right off your website. I mean, dude, it's you know, not only are you one of the top funds and fund managers in cannabis, you're one of the top funds and fund managers in all of the investment world, in the hedge fund world. That's absolutely incredible. I remember when I had Emily on, I said, I would probably have a shirt saying that, a t-shirt that just says we're number one, but you guys are so humble about it. You just go about your business. That is awesome. I mean, at some point when you see these accolades, you got to take a step back and be like, damn. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been an amazing seven years filled with uh, stress, anxiety, but the good moments, uh, you know, pay for itself pretty fast. But uh, yeah, no, it is, it's been, you know, that track record is, we had no idea when we were starting out doing this. We just were focused on good companies, focused on the industry, and we just believed the returns would take care of themselves. And, you know, it's been working for us for, for many years now. You guys have done it. You have the accolades to back it up. You know, I, every time, I got to be honest, a lot of times when we have guests on this show, I go in, I look at their website, to look at their board of directors. I mean, some of the biggest companies that we have, you or Emily are on the board. You guys are an investment, uh, an investor in that particular company. You sit on 15 different boards. You're all over the cannabis space. So earlier today on LinkedIn, we had a little back and forth going, and I posted the picture of, of Superman and Supergirl and said that that is you and Emily doing your side hustle. I, I honestly kind of look at it that way, right? Because we look at what this plant can do for this country and the world, do for us, not just from a medical standpoint, a wellness standpoint, from a sustainability standpoint, we can get into all these topics, uh, social justice, all that stuff. And you guys are not only advocating for it, but you're also putting capital behind it to make sure that the right companies get funded and make sure that these companies can put good out into the world. And it just so happens she's blonde, you've got brown hair, it matched up perfectly. So I think that's a very appropriate image of what you guys do. We're going to get into the professional side of this soon, but it's got to be a good feeling that not only are you participating in the cannabis space, but you and your sister really get to help architect it and create the industry that we're all massive fans of. You know, we, we took that approach from day one. 
we just thought it was so important. Um, it needed to be legitimized. And we thought capital could be so powerful in doing that. So when you can point capital in good direction, um, especially, you know, if you can even imagine what this was like back in 2013, um, when we were forming Poseidon and doing our research and, you know, there wasn't, there's nothing like it is today, right? I mean, you have, you have so many more resources today to, to look at as you get into this space, but back then we had to build it. And so that was just our idea was just, we'll just build every piece that we need to build to help guide this industry in a positive direction. Because we felt if we didn't, um, you know, we knew hot money would come in and we know that is a massive distraction that can take things in directions that are, are for the fast buck and they're, those are not really the foundation of a durable industry. And so we wanted to take that time and focus on, on the guardrails. Uh, you know, regulation is everything in the space. It can be the greatest headwind or the greatest talent, right? And so trying to be smart about that, sensible, can't say we've, as an industry, have done a perfect job at all, um, but we're learning and evolving. And that's, that's what's so important along this journey of an emerging industry but getting those initial foundations right, and also just trying to power companies that also had that similar vision of wanting to build a legitimate industry, focus on a longer term horizon, knowing that it would take a lot to get there. Uh, and so it's been a huge collaborative effort. I mean, we've now with two funds and you know, we've invested over 100 plus companies across the United States and Canada and Mexico and Latin America and Europe, um, still predominantly focused here. But, um, but all of us moving together, we just feel that collective power in a positive direction. Well, selfishly, I'm glad that you're focusing here because I would love for this country to be a powerhouse in the cannabis space. And, and I try to remind folks when we talk about the cannabis space, the smoking a joint, the reefer madness, the thing that you guys think about if you're not in this industry, that's only the smallest piece of it, right? And Morgan and I are going to get into industrial hump and I can't get there. So I'm kind of pulling back to ask you about that. But I know that you know a lot about it. I saw some articles today. I want to right now take it back to 2013 or maybe even 2012. I don't know when this phone call happened, but, you know, talking to Emily and she's told the story many times that she basically picked up the phone and said, hey, Morgan, I figured it out. I know what we're going to focus on and it's going to be cannabis. Now, I heard that end of the phone call. I'd like to hear the second end of the phone call like, Emily, are you smoking right now? Are you serious? <laughs> or hell yeah, let's do this. I've been thinking the same thing. You know, take me back to the beginning because in 2013, you were two years before Colorado went adult use. So it was purely medical back then. That's right. So Emily and I had a, a long history of, of just kind of like batting ideas back and forth anyway. Um, we came from a, an entrepreneur family. Our parents were entrepreneurs. They ran their own family business. Um, my dad, uh, started by fixing up old cars um, into show quality and going Wait, and winning I, I want to stop you there a second because that is an obsession of mine. I actually, if I could pull back the, the Zoom meeting and show you the background of my, of my computer, it is the uh, 68 Mustang Bullet. It's a recreation by a company called Revology that basically takes a modern car or they rebuild a Mustang with modern components, but it looks just like the original. When I read that about your dad, I missed that when I was going through Emily. You seem to talk about that more. As a kid, if, if you were around at that time, that had to be so cool. And I'm only going off on this tangent because I'm obsessed with old cars. And that's a dream of mine, not as a business, but as a hobby to buy cars, redo them and, and put them out there. And now I read that your dad started with that and that led him to his real estate empire. So now I'm looking at it like, all right, Todd, maybe this isn't a hobby. It, I mean, it was amazing. He was a very smart man, and, but also very good with his hands. I lack the mechanical, I mean, my friends are watching right now. They know <laughs> Morgan with a, a toolbox is not a common situation, but it was, <laughs> it was a really cool experience growing up, you know, just to see what he would take in that would come off a flatbed of his rust bucket and then exit the garage and this beautiful paint job, like the paint jobs he could do was just incredible and this was just in our barn in our backyard in in upstate new york and and it just was cranking those things out and and just using that profit and then buying into real estate and you know he would take these homes in in buffalo new york in terrible shape and and turn them into livable homes they, they could do the electricity the plumbing obviously all the drywall and you know changing rooms around and just making them into homes and then and then renting them and then built up this whole portfolio of real estate 
before Buffalo real estate actually appreciated value, but it was still, you know, it was a good family business. And I certainly, that was one thing I did do a lot of was I would cut all the lawns of all the different properties or I'd, I would be in there painting and, and helping with some of the, the, um, just anything around around these houses moving i can't even tell you how many fridges i've moved up and down three flights of stairs in buffalo in the middle of the summertime and you know whatever it was to help out but so i think just from that from the beginning was just this idea of you know you can create your own path and and you know family is a can be a very powerful way to do that and so that you know comes back to how emily and i were just kind of bat around ideas so when she brought up cannabis i was like let's take a look and so just started doing research and, and was like, holy cow, this is, there's a lot here. Um, a lot more than, you know, cause there's, there's so much more to our story too, with our family history and our dad and mom passing and cannabis mm -hmm. is, you know, discussion in hospice is, you know, just even from a palliative care standpoint. And, and, you know, so it was an important thing to us anyway. Um, so that's why when she had brought it up, I was like, yeah, I, this could be something that would be really uh, potentially fulfilling from like a family perspective. Um, but we could also do something that uh, could change history and be a part of that. And that's, you know, once you get that feeling, you just can't shake it. And so as soon as like that, that came together between her wanting to do something in the, in cannabis or marijuana at that time, but we were like, how do we even, what do we even do? You know, to your point, like there's it, Colorado was medical, but in November 12th, that's when they voted to legalize. And we just like, that's it. That is, that's, now we're going. Um, and my investment background, I just, looking at the space, I was just like, there is no capital. Uh, if you're trying to invest in the space, how are you gonna go about doing it? No one's figured it out. So no one has a competitive advantage. Let's all go for it at the same time and, and let the chips fall where they may. So you were one of the first people who had to figure out at that point, how do I invest in something that's a schedule one substance by the federal government? because it's legal on the state level. Um, it wasn't actually fully legal from an adult youth standpoint when you guys decided that you were going to take this journey. How do you even approach that subject where it's, you know, I'm sure, and, and honestly, I don't even understand it at this point because I haven't looked into it, but you are technically profiting off of a Schedule One substance or a company. We all know the trials and tribulations of being in cannabis, you know, losing banks, losing payment processors. I imagine as a fund, you're losing bank accounts with significant amounts of money in them. It's not like, you know, they're kicking Morgan Paxia's personal checking account out. It, it's your fund and everything else. So how do you even go about at that point figuring out how do I back a Schedule One substance that's not legal at the federal level? And it still isn't, but clearly people have figured it out. We broke it into, I would say, phases. So phase one was let's really focus on um, supporting industry, you know, be at least one, uh, one degree removed, uh, one standard deviation or so removed from the actual plant touching. Um, and we, well, what, that was how we were thinking about it on the equity side, but on the debt side, we're like, we can actually potentially do some growth like financing via debt, um, get high rate of return on that debt. Um, it would be a great way for us to learn how to, you know, how these operations work, start to learn some of the operators. And it's just amazing, I think, this years ago. Um, but we were getting 18 to 20% debt um, because before things got super regulated, uh, these companies were cash flow positive. Um, but you couldn't own equity. Like, you couldn't own equity in California. You couldn't own equity yeah. in Colorado as a California fund. Um, so debt was an option to, to get involved with, with operators. But we also just thought, well, you know, we kind of took the mentality of picks and shovels of the gold rush, you know, which kind of sounds, I don't know, corny today to say that, but that was our thought process, right? And so we would we would look at lighting and, and you know, so ag tech efficiencies, um, technologies, um, SaaS based solutions, just seeing all the problems these growers and these retailers were facing, were trying to be compliant and doing things on clipboards was just crazy. So like technology can help solve this. Um, so we really focused initially on ancillary and then started doing some debt with operators and then eventually transitioned over. But we our documents, um, I mean, that's another component, was finding a law firm that would write a, a PPM uh, and yeah. build out the risk disclosures. And we did, we found a, a great firm in California and San Francisco that was willing to do that. We were the first cannabis fund with a PPM 
with those risk disclosures. I mean, you see all these other funds today, and you know they they um, have pretty much the same laundry list of risk disclosures, but it's all there. Um, that certainly has been a uh, inhibitor to institutional capital, which is changing today. But for years, once they saw that risk disclosure list, no way were they investing in our fund. Um, and so it was all family offices, high net worth individuals that were understanding of the risks. Um, like actually our first LP was a lawyer. He understood the risks. And so he was like, I, I get it. I, I just, I'm not, yeah. I, I know this is the, the, but as an LP in a fund, the odds of action coming against me are incredibly low. I'll take that risk. And so we'll never forget him. He's, he's been an incredible supporter of ours for years. Um, I, I feel like that guy got a lot of reference calls for you. <laughs> he did. Oh yeah. We kept him very busy. We made more money. So that, that's awesome. That's awesome, man. I can only imagine how exciting it was back then because, you know, I, I can look at your LinkedIn and kind of figure out how old you are and we're kind of in the same arena. And I know, you know, I can do math and figure out when you started and being at the age that you guys were and deciding that you're going to pump, you know, seven figures plus into the, into the cannabis space. You know, you, you had experience in finance, but it wasn't like you had this massive track record as a hedge fund manager. And, you know, I have some experience in the family office world. That's 100% what they want to see. But nobody else, you know, you might have other hedge fund managers, but nobody had a track record in cannabis at that time. So, you know, like you said, you were on a level playing field with everybody else. It must have been so exciting. Now, Emily gave me a little insight into your investment strategy. And she says it has a lot to do with the names of your past two boats. The first one being Penny Pincher and the second one still pinching. So <laughs> I, I've got to hear the story behind these names and how that leads into your investment uh, strategy. Yeah. You know, I, um, I'm just, I have a lot of respect for the dollar and uh, it's been probably growing up in Western New York, you know, I feel like they never really left the Great Depression. So people are just very, very mindful of money and, and wanting to, you know, if you're going to use it, try to make it in a productive way. And so uh, Penny Pincher, yeah, it was our first boat. It was a, a boat my wife and I bought right after we got married. Um, so we were very excited about it, but it was, we had saved our, our nickels and dimes for, you know, for quite a while. And, and after we got married, we're like, okay, we, we paid for the wedding, we paid for the honeymoon, we can, we can buy our first boat. And, uh, you know, just having that, um, that respect for money, I think is, is something we look for in, in our investors or investments as well is that they will utilize capital um, and not spend it frivolously. And that's why, you know, the controls in this space have been, they've kind of ebbed and flowed. And, um, and we've noticed that there were some, you know, during certain moments, um, people were a little more lenient and we didn't like that. So we're, we're, you know, we tend to be very involved and very cautious about things because, um, and, and I think that's kept us away from some of the high flyers, you know, that did grab a ton of attention, but burned up, right? They burned up yeah. and, they're gone or they're a, a shell of their former selves. Um, and, you know, that path that, you know, you can keep, keep plugging along and all of a sudden you can break out, you know, like look at the guys at, at GTI. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget. We were, we started investing with them when there was 30 people and, and they were in one state and now they're one of the largest operators, free cash flow or operating cash flow positive and, you know, heading in a fantastic direction. So, you know, they have that discipline too. They talk about Warren Buffett. We talk about Warren Buffett you know, as, um, as someone that's again, similar mindset of just super devoted to, um, to the value of the dollar. I like, I love that you have the lighter there too. Yeah. I do. I do. Um, you know, we have a lot of different sponsors and everything else like that, but I will say that, that rise, the rise dispensaries down here are some of my favorites. And I think GTI does an amazing job as do a lot of the operators in Florida, but you know, I've got personal friends that work for the company and it, it's been a great organization down here for the state and they've been big supporters of C-Lab. I'm, I'm happy that you guys back them. I know I think I called it out when Emily was here, but you guys have bet on the right horses for, for lack of a better term, right? Um, I, listen, I don't run an investment firm. My, my, when I decided what am I going to do in cannabis, I decided to buy a microphone and a webcam and do this instead. But, you know, my fund will come later and we'll see. But um, where was I going with that? I really had a path that I was going down, I swear. Um, oh, 
I kind of looked at the industry and I saw all these companies blowing up, right? Going public, raising tons of capital, going for a land grab, going for market share, kind of like how the tech industry blew up, that Uber was so unprofitable for so long. But then you take a step back and I did spend a little bit of time with a VC in this space and we don't need to get into that. But you take a step back and you go, wait a second, this isn't tech. This isn't a platform that people need to get on. And then all of a sudden you can turn on the monetization and boom, the cash flow starts coming in. These are farmers. This is farming. This is retail. This is logistics. These are gold old American blue collar industries. It's not tech. Like you're not going to go out and buy ping pong tables and, and latte machines and, and win everybody over. So I always took a step back and there are companies, you know, some of them are here that I'm, I'm friends with. And there are companies that just had a few dispensaries in their city or in their state and a few locations. I'd look at them and they're like, yeah, you know, we're killing it. We're going to buy it. We're going to do another acquisition. We're growing slowly. We're making sure we can make that profitable. Then we're going to move on to the next one. And something just clicked in my head. And I'm like, those are going to be the companies that are going to be the names of tomorrow. It's not going to be, you know, and we can call some of them out, the MedMen's of the world and everything else because, and, and maybe they were, you know, I give MedMen a lot of shit, but they were the first ones that I heard on, about on the radio, on the Howard Stern show. But I always thought that it was going to be this second crop of companies that stayed in their lane, stayed in their state, didn't try to become an MSO in every state as it came online and grew slower that were going to be the names that we're going to recognize in the future. I'm still not sold that a lot of the big names that we see today are going to be the ones that are around. Am I kind of, I mean, I know I, I get to Monday morning quarterback it here, but is this kind of what you saw when you're, you know, I know you do a boots on the ground approach and you're going to meeting with hundreds upon hundreds of companies. Is that kind of the thesis that you and Emily took? Like, Hey, let's go with the guys that are bootstrapping it and kind of working the way that dad worked his business and let's back them because we have faith in them. Yeah, it certainly gives you a lot more confidence that uh, they're not going to be coming knocking on the door next week, needing cash again, you know, and, and there was a period of time where there was a lot of money flowing around. And so people just got used to the idea of, oh, we'll just raise more money. That was just the, that was considered a commonplace and we couldn't stand that. You know, we were early investors up in Canada. Uh, the one that we really got behind early was Afria. Um, I'm sure you've heard of them. And um, mm -hmm. It, but at the time, they were greenhouse growers, tomato growers, leafy greens. If you can make money in that business, then we thought, well, that makes, you know, that is a true commodity. They are fighting for basis points of margin. Yeah. So if we start going into cannabis, that is really interesting. And so we just felt they, they really appreciated low cost structure and, um, and thought that was a, a very smart way to play that market. We did also believe that Canada was going to go with a model of, few but large um just because that's kind of the canadian way right you look at the banking industry there's two same idea so we just kind of thought it was going to be like that and so we we got behind them and um had no idea you know we had no idea how, obviously no one knows what the future is going to be like and so we just thought okay this is a good company you know really focused in this way and it worked for a while but then they got kind of sucked into the fomo and just started doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So, you know, nice thing about a public company is you can sell. So we, we yeah. pulled the trigger, got out um, before everything really fell apart up there. We just thought, you know, Canada was getting way too ahead of itself generally anyway. So kind of similar idea to your point of like, they all were kind of like Uber, just burning cash like crazy, raising huge amounts of money, just loose, not really anything fundamentally. So like, this is gonna be a mess, let's get out of here. And at that time, that's when the US multi-state model was emerging but there weren't many good ones. I mean, there still aren't. I, I totally agree with you that, you know, the names today are, there may be a few that will resume, but most will start to fall apart. I think a lot of them won't even make it to the a NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange. When those exchanges open, they just won't, their financials won't make, won't get there. They won't be able to truly be gap audible. Um, and that'll help that turnover. But there's some fantastic private companies coming, um, some that are in our portfolio. Um, that have been you know a little more quietly building uh very large uh businesses but with a very focused approach on their state selection um the entry points and um, tight sgna controls and so they have fantastic EBITDA margins they're you know fundamentally i i love cannabis when right now i mean i've loved it for for years but i think even right now is so incredibly interesting when you look at 
the valuations we have in cannabis, the companies that are emerging, the fundamental focus versus almost the rest of the world, which is, feels like it's gone totally loony. And we have cannabis where there's sanity. It's like, <laughs> if you said five years ago, would you think that we would come to cannabis for sanity? I don't think anyone would have taken that seriously, but I really do feel like that right now. And it's incredible. And the growth is amazing. I mean, you have businesses growing 50, 100% plus, and they have, you know, 20 to 40% EBITDA margins and scaling. And it's like, and they're not burning, you know, they don't, hundreds and hundreds of millions wasn't at their disposal. So you didn't even have that choice for a lot of companies. You had to be disciplined. So I think that's like why, you know, we work in this space well is because it feels kind of natural for us. So like, yeah, that's, that's how you should build businesses. I, I think that's really important that you say that is you look for businesses that look like businesses. You know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a cannabis business, but how are you running your company? Are you running it like a business? Are you running it like a traditional business? Do you understand basic business principles? And you'd be surprised how many people in this industry don't fit that model alone, model alone. but it's crazy to me, like you said, that you're looking at the cannabis industry for sanity and valuations, and it's been deemed essential. Like two things that we never thought would happen for our industry. And it's crazy to me that, that there aren't people in government at this point in time with the election coming up that are not looking at this industry and saying, that's our solution right now. That's what's going to bring our country back. And, you know, to, to touch on all the points I said earlier, there are so many ways that this industry can build jobs. It's essential. It's growing. They're hiring people. I don't want to say everybody's making money, but the people who are making money or should be making money are making money. You said there's a bunch of great private companies in your portfolio. We'll save all the insider trading information for when we're off camera um, at the end of the interview. But, you know, it's super exciting. I can tell how passionate you guys are, which is the most, ex that's, that's why I like you and Emily so much because you guys just seem so authentic. You don't seem, I, I spent two years raising capital for hedge funds you don't seem like hedge fund managers. You don't seem like Wall Street people. You seem like two people that just love this industry and want to support it. I imagine that you guys both come to work every day with very large smiles on your face. Uh, we have 100% alignment. I mean, our, our lives are on Poseidon. We don't, we're, we're building Poseidon alongside our companies, building their companies. We're, our money is in our funds. And so we are in all, all these companies. So we are right there along with our partners, our investors, portfolio companies. We have every bit of alignment. And I think that is, you need that dedication to cannabis because it's hard. It will chew up and spit out people. I mean, I can't even tell you how many funds tried to launch, failed to launch, failed to make good investments, just, you know, kind of went out the back door. So many. I mean, I can't even keep track. I mean, and, and I still know apparently there's like dozens of them out there right now. Um, it's really hard finding quality companies, um, you know, that check all the boxes. It's, it's not easy. Um, and to your point, like, yes, we're essential now, but I'll tell you in late March, that was scary. And that's not been the only scary moment we've had in, in seven years. You know, just yeah. Jeff Sessions was very scary. He was very close to causing massive, um, uh, just pretty much almost shutting the industry down. Um, you know, COVID was very close for us too. And, um, you know, as an industry, we, we, you know, trying to get alignment, uh, doing a better job in Washington um, to, to continue to move things forward. Because um, we do need to do that. There's a tremendous amount of work to be done here. Anyone thinking they're just jumping in and, and getting to ride this wave, you know, you'll just get washed over the back of the wave because it, it takes those that will keep paddling and pushing and to catch the wave. And it, it's a lot of work. Um, and so, you know, I think that passion is, is definitely there. Um, and, for, and we look for that too in our founders. You know, any companies that, that have that dedication, if they're just looking to, to make money, I, it's, you're doing it for the wrong purpose. I mean, there are still people in jail. There's still some fundamental issues with the, um, you know, the, the institutional racism in this country. And, and cannabis is, is right in the, in the crosshairs of that. Of We can be a powerful change agent. Um, and we can do that as an industry as we get bigger and stronger. Um, but the work is obviously far, far from done. Um, and, you know, and it, it's good to see the progress, but it's also really sad to see people, people's lives getting dramatically impacted. Um, and, and we, and we respect that greatly. You know, we don't, we're not here 
for a free profit. We're right there yeah. trying to work with people in DC and, and putting our money into policy groups and trying to help uh, continue to move forward. And our companies do that too. You know, they have that you know, alignment as well. I mean, you look at Ascend Wellness and what they did with Last Prisoner Project with matching donations. That was incredible. Uh, and they yeah. jumped right on that. They're like, yes, this needs to be done. And, and to see now Joe Rogan repost something from Steve D'Angelo about Last Prisoner Project multiple times on his Instagram to me is incredible. And it just shows the power and the reach of our industry, right? Um, you know, Joe's a, a cannabis advocate, but I don't think he gets too involved in the business side of it. And to, to have someone of that level, you know, just signed a $100 million deal with Spotify, um, Spotify, hey, I'm here. Um, <laughs> you know, it, that, that's incredible. And that's what I love about this industry the most is, is the passion, right? Um, I was somebody who just kind of, I, I've always been in sales. I kind of chased money until I found myself in this industry. And I all of a sudden became one of those people that couldn't wait for Monday morning to get up, go to work and just work in it every day. And then when that opportunity fell through, I told you, I bought the camera, I bought the microphone and I started doing this. So I had a platform to introduce. Honestly, I started this as a platform to show my friends and the people that I've worked with and people on my LinkedIn, like, look how great this industry is. And it just turned into something better. But I'm, you know, that's, you see that throughout the industry. And I think it's so cool. You know, when you're taking you're meetings with people, too, by the way. thank you're you very great, much. Great, I wasn't fishing for compliments great. yet. <laughs> I will later on. Trust me. Um, I need them. I have that stand up comic mentality. I need everybody to like me. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you look, so, so going back to 2013, I imagine that things were much, much harder in the first four or five, six years than they are a little bit now. And I say that because today we've got companies that focus on the data and analytics of the cannabis industry and they kind of do that for you. I know you've built your own platforms and models and everything else. There we go. It's blending into your background, but <laughs> um, <laughs> headset. So, so you have companies, you've invested in a company that provides you data and everything else, but in 2013, 14, 15, 16, I imagine there was a lot of flights, a lot of hotels, a lot of fast food, and a lot of time on the road and a lot of, a lot of pitch decks. I, you know, I, I read a story about how you said, Hey, listen, we're a cannabis fund. You don't need to educate us on the opportunity of the industry. We figure that out. Start at slide seven. Right. Yes. And then I imagine the other thing is when you're sitting down with a company, how did you feel when they talked about exit strategy or what that cash out was? Is that something that turned you guys off? Were you looking for founders that were in it for the long run and really weren't thinking about exits unless it was just trying to get a little bit of cash along the way? No, exit strategy is a, a very common discussion. Um, but back in those early days, uh, yeah, if people were trying to define it too soon, that was a, that was a red flag, right? Because then they didn't really care. You know, if like we just do this, this, and this, and we'll sell. I mean, people can play that trade, but you're, who are you selling to? You're also making an assumption that there's someone that's going to buy at a point when there wasn't, there wasn't much M&A activity. We, we thought, we always knew M&A activity would become a big part of this industry, but to your point, yeah, back in 13, 14, people talking about exit strategy via M&A, which is like, it doesn't make sense yet. Um, and that's why there was that early bubble in the public markets. Um, if you look, um, uh, you know, if you go to like New Cannabis Ventures and you go to their uh, Allen's um, Global Cannabis Stock Index chart, in 14, there was a, there was a bubble. Um, and then that burst. And then there was obviously the big bubble driven by Canada and California that burst. And that took 29 months. Um, and we'll have to get into that uh, in a minute. But, you know, when we were looking at pitch decks back then, you know, anyone trying to put a TAM on the industry, we just, yeah, we kind of laughed at that. The hockey sticks always make us, you know, still laugh uh, when you're doing not even in a lot of those companies at stage, we're doing pre-revenue, um, you know, just that kind of uh, idea stage, because that's what we did invest in early on. And they yeah. were like, oh, we're going to be doing 30 million by year three. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> it's just like, no, you're not. Like, it's just, it takes more money to get there. So, you know, yeah. what, what is that plan? And so, you know, then it's just kind of the, the pitch deck is worth more about the thought that goes into it and the people behind it. And that's what we're trying to discover when we're looking at those things. And then we have our, you know, our 
whole due diligence process that we go through. And, and now it's certainly is, is a heck of a lot easier too, because we can just make 10, 15 phone calls and find out about companies and who their partners are. And, or if we're sitting on boards, we, we, you know, we're seeing some of these portfolio or potential portfolio companies. Um, but back then, yes. I mean, Emily, was, Emily would cold call companies back in 13. Hey, we're That's launching cool. a fund in January that we're going to be looking to make investments. Are you looking for capital? She would cold call companies. It was amazing. And, That's uh, crazy. Yeah, but we were just, you know, we did a lot with trade shows. You know, we were doing NCIA's uh, annual show. I think there was 800 people the first year we did it in Vegas. And, you know, what, where did it top out? It was like 30-something thousand last year, right? Are you talking MJ Biz or NCIA? Because oh, I know M- MJ Biz, MJ Biz. Well, yeah, we did N- NCIA does great events, but they tend to be like five thousand, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. MJ, but Biz. MJ, no, MJ Biz is, is a circus now. And then you got your sister running around making people go to karaoke. I'm glad I haven't met you guys yet before the last one, but you know, I don't know if I'm getting out of the next one. I know. So yeah, we just we believe that you know you got to build the relationships, and that takes time. That means being in markets, and uh, and so we traveled a lot. Um, and it's amazing, you know, obviously the world has changed and so thankful for all the travel we did when we did. And like last year was amazing. We were all over the world, um, you know, UK, uh, Portugal, um, uh, Switzerland, uh, uh, Hong Kong, um, obviously Mexico a lot, you know, just got to go all, all over. And so just meeting people and seeing what's happening and it's amazing, it's truly amazing. But you know, those, those relationships, those colleagues, are, are invaluable for us now because can you imagine trying to meet people is, you know, in doing it this way is, it's not the same. Um, certainly yeah. look forward to when we'll be able to be with people again safely. Um, yeah, but just very thankful for everything we did over those years when we could, because uh, it's definitely different now. You guys took advantage of it. I mean, Emily told me she feels weird being stuck at home because you guys are constantly on the road. And I imagine that the the sentiment is is similar with you as much as it's probably great to spend more time with your wife. Um, How have you guys been able to operate since the shutdown happened? I mean, is it just a lot more phone calls and Zooms and all the the unfun side of it? No, no grow tours. Yeah, no, we've, yeah, we've been very much behind the desk. Um, Huge mental shift. Um, I still have a video on my phone from the day I closed our office. Um, it was a really sad moment. You know, obviously I had no idea. I thought we'd be back in a month. No oh. idea that here we are. And, you know, I think we're allowed to have two people in our office in, California, in San Francisco. Um, so, but, you know, what's been really interesting in this year is the focus even further. So we got super focused on companies because we weren't spending so much time on airplanes uh, we were working so much with our portfolio companies and it's been really exciting to see what companies have accomplished through this time. I mean, just massive uncertainty. It, you had uh, a system that was completely shocked. So you had supply chain disruptions, surges in demands, you know, just all kinds of chaos. Then sadly in California, we had looting. Now we have fires. I mean, we're sadly getting used to fires, which is insane, but um, yeah. But anyway, so it's been very productive. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot of uh, um, intake calls with uh, potential companies and, and just looking at how this strategically fits within our portfolio and our investment thesis. Um, so 2020 is, you know, it, it's, it's been a hell of a year. It's, it's so stressful for so many people and I feel so bad for, you know, what's happened to a lot of families that have lost loved ones um, in this, in this pandemic, but um, we're very, very lucky. I, I, I mean, I can't believe, you know, we have a thriving industry. We have companies at all time record sales, all time profitability, you know, gross margin expansion, big growth. And, you know, so just every day, we just feel lucky that we are here in this industry. We are job creators, we are taxpayers. You know, we're, we're moving this country forward in a positive economic direction right now. I think there's 250,000 plus employees right now, right? In cannabis in the United States. You're asking the guy who reads headlines to come up with a detailed fact. You're the investor, dude. I mean, I'm just, I said microphone camera. That's what I do. Um, but no, I, I read, I actually read that there's actually more people working in cannabis now than there are people in coding or that that's going to be surpassed soon, which is incredible. Incredible. And they're so good, I do read a little bit. Good paying jobs. You know, that's the other thing too, is like, these are, 
these are good paying jobs and and you know we're, it's still very early um you know california i think is is expand uh you know enjoying some tailwinds right now um i think covid actually helped um uh, to combat the illicit market and so we're seeing really nice growth that we've felt like was a headwind for a long time and i think it's you know from the vape hysteria which was completely driven by the illicit market um, I don't care what anybody tries to say, spinning it the other yeah. way, but that was just some garbage and some vape products. We dealt with that like four or five years ago. Most people don't know that because they weren't in this industry at that time, but there have been these waves of garbage stuffed in these illicit products. And that's what the illicit market does. It doesn't give a shit about testing or anything. It just cares about moving the product. And yeah. I think consumers are like, well, wait a minute, I can go to a store or I can order from my phone and have it delivered. And I, it's been tested and it's, and I don't have to worry about getting, you know, I can see that it's past, you know, it's clean from pesticides and heavy metals and toxins and stuff. And so anyway, so I think we're seeing a nice shift there, um, which is very, very important from a regulating standpoint. If, if other states see, that we are penetrating what has historically been a very prolific illicit market. I think that gives a lot more uh, positive momentum as if we didn't need it. I mean, what was this industry? It was an $8 billion industry in, in, uh, in 19, and we're gonna be 13 billion here. I think they said between 13 and 15. Incredible. 22 next year. Incredible, yeah. And so, dude, I mean, you preach into the choir here. I. I you know, you, you talk about the illicit market and how the vapes and everything drove that. There's actually, so obviously, if you can't tell, I'm a Rogan fan. He did an interview with a guy, I want to say at the beginning of the year, John Norris, who's uh, he's like a, a parks ranger. But what his job is, is to actually break up these illegal grows that are growing on public California lands in the parks. And it's, it's messing with the ecosystem. And he talks about the toxins that they use on these plants that the cartels use. And they say after that toxin's been sprayed or the pesticides they use, that a human being can't touch it for three days. And that's what people are smoking and they're putting in their lungs. And it was actually, I don't remember if it was before that podcast or around there, but that's what drove me to get my card here in Florida. Um, I'm like, why, why would I want, you know, what, even if it's cheaper, even whatever it is, if you get better, people say they get better product on the illicit market. No, you, you don't get better park because you're smoking pesticides too, right? So you're preaching to the choir, man. I, it's funny. I look at California, though. California, just because of how far advanced everything is, it looks like it's kind of its own industry ecosystem, if you will. And it's very different from all the other adult use markets or even medical markets across the country. Is California at least, are they a trendsetter or is Colorado more of the trendsetter? Because I feel like Colorado might be more of the trendsetter on the policy side and California is more on the innovation and brands and everything else. Is, was, is that accurate? I'm biased. Um, I think the best products are coming out of California, um, hands down. I mean, we just have the longest history with it. I mean, Oregon has some great products as well. Uh, Oregon is, a, is right up there. Um, they just have the most time you know, cultivating this plant, understanding genetics. And, and so we just have a robust opportunity set of uh, just, and, and it's so amazing to see the, the different strains that come out every year. And, uh, and you know, and you go to these other markets and they're very limited. I mean, they, they enjoy the limited nature of them as an operator. They, you know, much better margins, much less competition, much easier to make money. Um, but their product development is years and years behind. And yeah. but you're right, they couldn't be more different. I mean, it is incredible what an East Coast operation versus a West Coast operation. Um, and the misunderstanding, there is a complete misunderstanding about California because there was that wave, huge bubble of, of brand creation in California because everybody did think this idea that California creates the best products. So we'll pay any price for a brand that's showing traction. And it was crazy. I mean, talk about the number of hundred million dollar plus pre money valuation deals we saw for brands that did like two to five million in revenue. You know, it's just it was insane. And so that completely exploded and left a, a very bad name for uh, for California for a while. That we're we're finally healing from as good operators that do have access to this incredible genetic footprint and knowledge base are now shepherding through more fundamental businesses. Um, that you know are getting these products safely to the consumers and so I, I think it's gonna be really interesting the next four or five years of what uh, cannabis is going to look like in the United States and I think California will be 
a very large part of it, not just because it's a big market, but because of uh, the value that it will create. Um, and that's not even talking about any kind of interstate commerce. I don't think, I think yeah. we're years and years from anything like that. So. I, I, I agree with that for sure. So, man, I, dude, I can keep you on here for two hours easily. Um, I had the same problem with Emily. The only reason I stopped that one is because I had a hard stop. Um, we we're talking about California. I, um, you talked about the bubble, the public market bubble, and you said you wanted to dig into that a little bit. Now, I, you know, so I created the show because I want to expose, I'm trying to get to the general public. And we have a lot of cannabis advocates and fans and companies and CEOs and whatnot that watch the show. But my goal is to get to the people who, who don't consume cannabis, who don't know anything about this industry. So I'm very critical. I don't want to say critical because who am I to judge? But I always look at things that are showing our industry off to the world. And I'm like, that's good for us. That's not good for us and everything else. Like there's a show that's on, I don't want to call it out by name because I really like the guy who it's about, but the show that just launched on discovery and I watched it and I'm just like, I think it buys into the stereotype too much. I don't think it's a good display of the actual California cannabis companies or Oregon or anywhere else that they are. So I get upset with things like that. And then when we look at the bubble, the, the public market bubble, I feel like people in government positions and people who are opposed to this industry wait for opportunities like that to pounce and say, see, look, they're not real. See, they're going to fall apart. See, I'm telling you, it's not a good industry. And when I saw that, we all know, listen, every industry has their bubble. Look at tech. It was 99. It, one of the, the industries that's sustaining us and making the U.S. you know, uh, continue a perennial world power had its bubble in 99 and then it became a massive industry. Every industry has that bubble going back as far as history goes. So dig into that bubble a little bit more. What caused it, what you learned from it, because I know that you guys touch all parts of the cannabis industry, public, private, all that. So, yeah. Yeah. We, so as things were getting really uh, heated again uh, in the, in the second bubble, the bigger bubble that happened at the, you know, when, when, uh, January of was it 2018 was when, when the market topped out and, and started its 29 month plus journey uh, and, and the way we looked that at that makes it, sense why you were number 10 instead of number one now I get it <laughs> So, which by the yeah, way we, folks number 10 is still absolutely amazing I'm just giving him crap because he's on this show still incredible go on 18 was actually our best year that was incredible the market was down like 60% but um, for another day. Um, so what we do, while we were going through this, we're always looking back at history because you know, we always say history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme, right? It's the Mark Twain quote. And, and so we're like, why? We don't need to relive uh, painful experiences um, if other industries have done this. So if you look at like the airline industry, the automotive industry, the tech bubble, you know, any of these new major impacts on society, game-changing industry creation, there were these early gyrations. And so what you have in the first gyration is, is kind of the, the, all, the, um, all the promise without the, without the foundation, right? It's all, you're all buying on, on a pro forma, as we, as we say. And, and so we're like, this is coming to an end. And, and we knew it because we said, Canada is not opening the way everyone was promised it was going to open. If you look at it, it's not doing that. Not surprising because regulation, to your point, this is not technology. This is a very regulatory driven industry. So if that growth doesn't materialize, all these pro formas are going to fail and there's going to be some real pain. And so, and we just figured that was going to be the end of that first wave where it was that buying the pro forma and there would be a long what we call the Darwin phase, washing out uh, while the good companies start to emerge and, and the ones that were not, not built for anything real uh, would fall apart. And so that's you know, really what we saw happening. And you know, with Fund One, we dialed back our, our public equity position to very, very low exposure, only the names that we wanted to stay with long-term that we're willing to ride through that cycle with and then just got rid of everything else. Um, and just reinvested and focused on the private markets, focus where we'd have more duration um, to, to wait through this environment. Um, and so that's, that's really what happened. And so it's amazing if, you know, we chart this uh, against the, the peak of the dot-com bubble and the peak of the cannabis bubble, and they are staggeringly 
consistent in the magnitude and duration of this cycle. I think we're off by like two months, but the drawdown, even with COVID, COVID brought us like a little bit down, but because that was an intra month that was within the month of March where we closed, it, it really kind of cut off some of that, that air pocket down. So we are following a very, very similar cycle of the dot-com bust and, and, and recovery. And so it's just incredible how, you know, people are, we're just, we are kind of predictable beings, not certainly in short term, we can be completely irrational, but over periods of time, there's, there's certain behaviors that you can, you can follow. And we're right there. I mean, now we're starting to see institutional money creeping in. We're seeing a rotation of early investors that were like, you know, forget it or, you know, just moving on. And now there's like some different capital coming in. And so this next phase is powering by those that are, are being much more fundamental. It's so cool that we're, you know, watching this cycle come through because we, you know, we've been talking about it for so long, but until it starts happening uh, on the upside again, you know, no one likes to not make money. So, um, you know, but we're here to, we're here to shepherd good companies. And as I said, you know, you do that right and, and the returns and the, and the uh, money will follow. And we're just at the, at this new cycle. And it's so cool. Mutual funds are buying in. Um, it, not fast. We know it's not fast because there hasn't been any regulatory change, but it's happening. And so that was something that we thought would be this really igniting of this next cycle. And, and here we are. So it's, it's, it's really exciting. But we're really only at the tip of the iceberg, right? Because if we look at the cannabis space, you have the medical market, you have the adult use market, and you have CBD for the most part, right? And, you know, it's funny, I, if you watch a few of the, the episodes leading up to this one, I do this thing where I go, you know, the adult use market is so small, then you have medical, and then there's going to be wellness, and then there's going to be industrial hemp. And I didn't realize that I, I watched the, the interview with Emily today that I basically stole that along with the hand motions from her and didn't even realize it. I'm like, man, this is actually pretty smart the way that I'm phasing this out. And then I plagiarized it. But, you know, we haven't gotten to industrial hemp. We haven't gotten to hemp plastics and hempcrete and, and, and textiles and steels and, and all these things that this plant can do that can replace things that are not as sustainable and not as cost effective. You know, we go all the way back to when cannabis was uh, put under prohibition with the, I think it was, was it's called the decorticator that mm -hmm. William Randolph Hearst actually fought against cannabis because it was going to put him out of business. So now we're going back a hundred years and we're picking up where we left off and said, no, this plant a hundred years ago was supposed to do all this amazing stuff for us. We need to bring that back. So when I look at the industry now, and again, I'm, I'm not the investor, um, I think that the adult use market will probably be one of the smallest pieces of it. The medical market will look different. It'll be a lot more, I want to say, isolated in the, as far as how the different cannabinoids work. And they're probably going to be pill form and standard dosage. So there's going to be a wellness market that will incorporate CBD and ratios and all this stuff. But then there's going to be this massive market for building products and, and, and clothing and cars. And I make the joke all the time that just one company just needs to get the Starbucks account for straws. So I don't have to deal with those pain in the ass paper straws anymore and get me a hemp plastic straw. And hopefully you'll be a multimillionaire, if not billionaire, just from Starbucks alone. Is that, are those the type of things that excite you at this point where we are in cannabis with things that we can do with industrial hemp and the things that the plant itself can do beyond just, we'll call it marijuana at this point? Industrial hemp, so we, we were very early in that space. Um, it's been a long process. Um, you you say that as in a little too early. Oh, uh, well, yeah, we were, you know, we've been early a lot, right? We were early with our fund. We were, we were, we were just ahead of kind of the curve. We, we just, I, the one thing that we, we miss, uh, I think we were off on, was believing capital would start flowing into industrial hemp area. Um, the passage of the farm bill sucked all of that capital into CBD. And, yeah. and that's, that was a, and we thought that was crazy. And, and so I know. would have made the same bet if I had the, the view of two markets. Okay. This is CBD. It's cannabis without THC. This is going to change the world. I'm like, well, everyone's going to pick that one for sure. No. <laughs> so, so we've been working, so this company's called Bass Fork. Uh, definitely check them out. Um, they're, they're actually in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, and so we have been basically re-engineering decortication, all that, all the post-harvest processing. Uh, their initial focus is on 
uh, textiles. So taking U.S. grown hemp, U.S. processed hemp, and turning it into U.S. clothing. So it's all here on the U.S. We can be completely self-fulfilling in our in that value chain, and uh, you know. So that's an area we've been investing for years now. It's been R and D for a super long time, trying to really get so much of that. Uh, figured out because it's not only just the technology for processing it, but then it's also the genetics and the regions you're growing it in that produce good quality fiber uh, from industrial hemp to then make your processing go that much more efficient. Um, I'm super excited for when our first pair of jeans will be rolling off the production line at a very large uh, in, uh, textile company. I won't name names yet, but it's a name we all know and probably have several pieces of clothing in our closet from that's, uh, you know, really been a big partner of ours in that area. And to your point, that's just one aspect of the industrial hemp complex. And you start thinking longer term and further R&D into those bioplastics and carbon nanotechnologies. And so you're talking about batteries and, you know, think about all the, the horrible, uh, uh, elements that we have to unearth for all of these batteries and all these cars today, you get to pull those out of the ground once and that's it, right? But hemp can be, is a very, very um, regenerative plentiful plant. And if and it has the carbon uh, uh, te technology base to potentially be a very powerful uh, um, superconductor for, for car batteries. So anyway, that's longer term. But near term, we, we figured textiles is a huge market, something very important. Just like people are getting um, sick of, of you know, where their food is coming from, um, where their cannabis is coming from, we figured clothing is an area that they're going to care about. How was this made? Where was this made? What process is it like mm -hmm. acid with all kinds of nasty chemicals? Well, we can do that here in the U.S. without doing any of that. Um, the challenge is the, the big difference between cannabis and hemp is cannabis and CBD in this regard has a pretty ready available consumer base. Right. I mean, there was already millions of cannabis consumers forever, mm -hmm. not just because we legalizing it. Um, there was already a massive demand base. Um, but in industrial hemp, we're, we have to do more building of the demand base um, in addition to figuring out all of the upstream. Um, so it's an area we are very passionate about as well. Um, it's just a different trajectory. Um, but ultimately, I agree with you. It's going to be massive. I mean, just incredible. I'm I'm super excited to watch that part of the industry. That's what excites me the most. Um, like you said, yeah, there there was a built-in user base for cannabis already. And I think when people dig in and understand what hemp products can do from the textile and every other side, that demand is going to be there instantly because people are already demanding sustainability and, and all that stuff. And hemp fits that bill. We're, we're getting up to, to six o'clock, which snuck up on me, but I have a few, I reached out to Emily for a few things because I, I finally had somebody on the inside that I could reach out to. I've never had that before for a guest. So she wanted me to ask you about the internal phrasing that you guys use. Hashtag take the meeting and nauseously optimistic. I'm actually more, I'm more interested in the second one, but let's talk about both of them. Sure. Uh, hashtag take the meeting is you just, you never know who you're going to you just, you take the meeting. Um, it, amazing people. Um, and it's all, we're all connected in some way or another. So take the meeting. Um, you know, we do get inundated with uh, meeting requests. So I'm sorry if for anyone out there that's tried to reach out and you have not responded, we try our best. Um, but, but certainly, you know, especially if it's like something totally off the wall of like, that seems very encroaching on us. You want to tell us what you want to do? Sure. We'll take the meeting. <laughs> So oh, that's, cool. that's, that's just been our mentality from day one. It's just, you never know. So take the meeting. Um, nauseously optimistic is just kind of our, the state of a fund manager in cannabis is, uh, cause you just, like I said before, like COVID, I mean, mid March, we were beyond nauseous, um, and not as much optimistic, but tried to hang it in there because, you know, believing ultimately things would, would come through. And so that's, you know, it's, it's like a, a capitalist, you're, you're, you know, you're kind of a permable, right? Um, but we, we still, it's still federally illegal. So you, you kind of have this nauseous feeling always. So. Well, it's a good thing cannabis helps with nausea. Um, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh my God. I, I don't know how people would be, I'll be, uh, it's 
That's why demand is so strong in COVID because I mean, for love of God, people need to be able to relax. And because this is hard, yeah. this has been a mentally draining, exhausting experience, even if you had no exposure to it. And we've known dozens of people at this point that have had it. And, you know, it's not been, it's been so hard. So, uh, yeah, Canvas has it, been very awful. Th- this show has, has kept me sane talking to people on my TV, apparently, is, is what I needed to do because I love my wife and I love my daughter. She's, you know, 10 months old, but we're coming up on six months next. I, so five and a half months on lockdown has been tough and, and everybody visiting me on my TV has been awesome. Um, I feel like this next one, next one, this next one kind of leads into the last one. You guys often watch a scene from meatballs. The it's just, it just doesn't matter scene. And that's what fire you guys up or cheers you up. How did that become a staple of Poseidon? Uh, my dad was a big Bill Murray fan. Um, so growing up, I just feel like, you know, it's funny is when you're a kid, you don't, you miss 90% of the jokes in those kind of movies. Um, oh, yeah. it was so much fun having that, you know, that was one of our, our staples in the house. And so it's just such a funny scene about, um, I mean, I don't know if many people know about meatballs, but if, if we, if I didn't have to worry about YouTube coming after me, I would share it here. But when we post this video on YouTube, they'll flag me. Yeah. Well, Bill Murray is an amazing human being. Um, oh, there's actually course. a great documentary on Netflix about Bill Murray, um, and it's almost like he's he's telling he's like giving us that uh, pep speech during. In that I didn't wait. What's that called? I haven't seen. I have to watch that one. Uh, what was it called like Finding Bill Murray or something like that? Okay. Or, um, I love Bill Murray. Ghostbusters, Caddyshack. I mean, everything that he did is, is great. Um, I mean, I'm a huge oh, SNL. Oh, those were all in the household. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Um, all right. You got to meet Warren Buffett recently. What was that conversation like? I, so, you know, Buffett is famous for saying that a lot of hedge fund managers can't beat the S and P. Did you say, Mr. Buffett, my name is Morgan and, and I've beat the S and P several times. So, I mean, that's, again, that's just the ego in me would have done that, but I know that he's been an, an idol of yours for a very long time. Well, I shouldn't let the truth get in the way of a good story, but uh, I didn't actually get to meet him. Uh, my wife and I drove across the country, and um, and I've I've driven by his house before, uh, but she hadn't seen it. So I'm like, let's stop. We'll have lunch in Old Market, super cute part of Omaha. And so we went, and I have a picture of her and I in front of his house and waving. Um, I would love to meet him someday. Um, I know his views on, on hedge funds are not... Um, are not stellar and he, he did win that 10 year bet. Um, but I think he would appreciate the venture capital part of what we do because that's where, that's where new companies are created. That's where new industry is created. And a lot of what he did was, you know, I think was trying to understand how things were happening and, and become a part of it. And so I think, you know, that's, that's where venture capital is so amazing is you, you're creating. And, um, and that's not just, exchanging money back and forth over an exchange you know that's you're building and um, yeah and that's really something interesting you know i i would love to be a fly on the wall for that conversation i mean because i think it's so interesting especially that you take a lot of the approaches that you got from him and to be like you know mr buffett i'm, I'm taking your methodology and applying it to cannabis of all things i think it would be an incredible conversation and then the last one and then we're gonna have to go um, and this is something that I've, I've witnessed with you. It's something incredible. And honestly, going back to that Superman, Supergirl picture, this is really what made me think of it more. I'm a huge comic nerd. I watch all the TV shows, the movies, all that stuff. And the relationship between Superman and his cousin, not his sister, is they're always building each other up. They're always each other's biggest fans. They're always, um, you know, you're better than me. No, you're better than me. You're the stronger one. You saved me. You saved me. I look at the way that you and Emily interact. And she, you know, she was very happy to say, and she said she doesn't know the reason behind it, that you're one of the true male feminists in the world, that you always believe in women, you always give them a platform, and you're always, you know, curious as, and and putting women out there first, treating them as equals, if not even, you know, kind of ahead, right? And I see how much that you support Emily and, and how humble you are with her. And literally, you guys post on LinkedIn back and forth, you're better, no, you're better, no, you're better. It's it's sickening for the rest of us. No, I'm kidding. But you know, what, what puts you in that mindset to just be so supportive and just be that true male feminist? I, 
I guess I don't really look at it as male and female. It's, it's just who we are, you know, we're people and we're passionate and, and smart. And my sister certainly is incredibly smart. Um, both my sisters are incredibly smart, far smarter than I am. Um, I'm just the baby brother that gets to go along for the, for the ride. And, um, so, you know, I also was a, a, probably a bit quieter, um, because I was the baby brother. Um, no, you know, I, I, I just, I love all of the studies too, that just are continually debunking that men are, you know, we are not as good at investing. We're not as good at a lot of things. We are equal or not as good as women are. And, and that's, and it's so cool because we get to, I get to live it and prove it every day with my sister, you know? And so it's just, it's very rewarding to see that equality and see that power actually it's because not quality, it's power. Um, because she's a dominant force in cannabis. I mean, she's got so much respect. And it was really hard early on because there was so much of that male dominism and like trying to like discredit her understanding of investing. And she's just run circles around around these guys. I yeah. love it. It's just it's so cool. And um yeah, and it's you know, she's she's putting deals together and understanding these things it's just so funny because then you know people come around i had that idea care if you had the idea you didn't do anything we did it and we're doing it and we're doing it together as a family and we're creating something that is historic and and i hope that's you know our mark in history will be there forever dude that that is absolutely incredible i i honestly think you guys are amazing i've i've enjoyed both conversations i really enjoyed this one uh, the hour goes by way too fast. We're definitely going to have to do this again. Hopefully when things get back to normal, maybe I can get out to California. We'll have you guys down to Florida. We'll do it in person. It'll be a whole lot more fun. But Morgan, you, Emily, everybody at Poseidon, thank you guys so much for what you're doing. You are helping create a real industry that the rest of us get to participate in. We get to be passionate about it. And you're right in the trenches fighting alongside everybody. And you know, I say this to, I only say this to a few people on the show, but I am very happy that there are people like you and your sister and the team that you put together in this industry. And I think you guys are great ambassadors for us. And I think, you know, I would put you in a room. You, there, there was a family office group that I was, an, uh, I was a part of, and I got to see you present uh, to that group and knowing the people in that group, seeing a cannabis manager in the room, it, it was awesome for me. So I'm very happy to see that. Let's promote uh, the website, any social media, anything else, and then we're going to go, but we're definitely going to have you back. Awesome. Yeah, we're Poseidon Asset on Twitter. I think I'm uh, at Morgan Paxia, otherwise known as Hedgy Best Dude. And, uh, you know, we're pretty active on our LinkedIn. Um, and uh, not so much on Facebook. I don't feel like we get much love on Facebook, but absolutely on Twitter and, and uh, LinkedIn. And then our website, uh, Poseidon.Partners, um, gives you a great – you know, we, we put as much as we're allowed to put up there um, and try to give people good insight into what we're doing. But if you just follow the banter on, on Twitter, Emily's got good stuff on, at MPAX1, I think, um, between that and our company, Twitter, and my Twitter, you'll see floating dumpsters uh, on fire going down my Twitter feed every now and then. <laughs> Less so now, but that, that was <laughs> a pretty common tweet for a while there. Thank you for All having right. me. No, absolutely, Morgan. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody at home. Uh, this has been an awesome episode. Join us tomorrow live at 5 p.m. Facebook.com slash Canna Business Group. This has been another episode of Elevate Your Grind. We're out.